All right, and it's one o'clock. Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Ambassador Yom Ettinger, co-founder of the American Israel Demographic Research Group, join us to discuss, does Israel face a Palestinian demographic time bomb? Ambassador, Ambassador Ettinger will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Ambassador Yoram Ettinger. Thank you very much. Uh, for the next uh, 15 minutes, uh, I will discuss the demographic balance between uh, Jews and uh, Arabs uh, in the combined area of uh, the pre-67 uh, lines of Israel and Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, as it is referred to. Uh, this issue, this demographic balance, constitutes one of uh, too many, too many examples of uh, issues which are substantially misperceived by policymakers and the public at large and uh, demonstrate a very wide and deep gap between reality on the one hand and the misperception on uh, the, other, uh, the other hand. Uh, and let's uh, start, uh, how, how do I, okay. Oh, the share screen. Yeah. Okay, uh, just one second, we'll, okay. Uh, the, the bottom line is right now on the screen, namely the misperception is that there is a demographic uh, time bomb. And in fact, uh, the Arabs don't have to even fight Israel militarily, they can fight Israel uh, through the fertility rate, through uh, uh, birth rate. And uh, that is very, very much different from reality. The reality, as stated in this uh, slide, uh, is that uh, there is an unprecedented Jewish demographic momentum, and at the same time, dramatic and unprecedented Arab demographic westernization, namely the birth rate, the fertility rate, have been westernized in uh, Arab uh, countries. We'll show it specifically in the next few, uh, few minutes. Everything which uh, I'm going to share with you uh, are the findings of a study which has been going on since 2004, conducted by three Americans, six Israelis. I represent that group, but it's a group uh, study, and uh, we do not integrate any assessments or any projections. Everything is documented. Uh, the gap between the misperceived uh, demographic balance and the real demographic uh, balance uh, is illustrated on two fronts. The first one is the uh, highly inflated, artificially inflated Palestinian numbers, uh, Arabs in Judea, Samaria, and Arabs in uh, Gaza, and at the same time, ignoring, ignoring the reality of the last uh, 25, uh, 30 years of an unprecedented Jewish demographic momentum. And uh, the bottom line of the highly inflated uh, Arab numbers, as again, I'm going to substantiate in the next few uh, minutes, uh, is uh, co consists of a few uh, elements and uh, they are briefly uh, uh, projected uh, or demonstrated uh, here. And uh, it, starts, it starts with the fact that the Palestinians ignore, ignore an international uh, convention or international uh, practice. Throughout the globe, countries deduct from their uh, census uh, 
uh, citizens, uh, permanent residents who are away for over a year, a year and a day of an Israeli student uh, in the US and that student is deducted from the census. The reason is after a year, you may be added to the country where you reside. Uh, for uh, schooling purpose, for uh, employment purpose, for travel uh, tourism uh, purpose, you return to the census of your country when you come back to the country for at least 90 days. The Palestinians do not abide by that rule. And as stated, not by me, but by the head of the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, after the first census, which was taken in 1997. And as you can see on the screen right now, uh, the chairman uh, or the director of the Palestinian Central uh, Bureau of Statistics stated that clearly they counted also 325,000 people who have been away for over a year. Uh, in 2004, as you can see on the screen, the election commission of the Palestinians uh, stated uh, that 200,000 uh, eligible voters were voters residing outside the country. Uh, at that time in 2004, 2005, the median age was 18. Uh, the right to vote starts at the age also of 18. If you have 200,000 overseas residents who are eligible to vote, it means that there are 400,000 residents who are not uh, in the country uh, or are not in the Palestinian Authority, but uh, are counted as if they are uh, there. We are talking about two, uh, 20, uh, 22, in fact, uh, 2020, 2022, we're talking about 500,000 overseas residents. The reason for the rising number, the increasing number is very simple. You start in 1997 with 325,000, but through birth, the number grows literally by the uh, day. Uh, here we have some documents which ascertain it, including the website of the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, which admits that while they follow the de facto approach, uh, there are some exceptions. And the exceptions are, for instance, all students studying abroad, irrespective of the study period, Palestinians who live abroad for more than one year, but again, they consider uh, the Palestinian Authority to be their country. And then we also talk about uh, the Palestinian, uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, Interior Ministry, where they stated in, uh, in 2014 that since 1995, they registered about 100,000 children born abroad, 100,000 children born abroad. And uh, obviously they have parents, it's already 300,000 people, but then you have those who uh, are not uh, producing uh, children. The bottom line is in 2022, you're talking about 500,000, half a million, who have been away for over a year from Judea and Samaria, but are counted as if they are there. Uh, We're talking about the issue of uh, birth. Issue of birth, as I show here, in 2006, the World Bank conducted a study of education as well as uh, birth in Judea, Samaria, and in uh, Gaza, and they stated that the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics projected, mentioned, indicated to them that there was a 24% increase in the number of registered six-year-old during 1995-2006. Uh, first graders, which is six-year-old, uh, means 
that every six-year-old in Judea and Samaria in Gaza registers to school. Uh, dropout, outrageous dropout rate starts only uh, third grade, fourth grade, where it's very high dropout, but first grade, especially also second grade, it's 100% registration. They projected 24% in the number of six-year-old, which means the birth of six years before that, but the World Bank found not 24% increase, but an 8% decline, which means 32%. 32% uh, uh, gap between the real number and the contended number by the Palestinians. We're talking about uh, net migration. The Palestinians claimed, as you can see here, uh, some 50,000 net immigration, net immigration into the Palestinian Authority uh, annually. Uh, however, our study, we found out that, in fact, uh, not only wasn't there any net immigration, every year, you can see with the green, there has been net emigration. Net emigration, uh, in fact, from 1950, when Jordan started uh, documenting uh, exits and entries, namely net migration, until 2000. 21, as you can see uh, here. In fact, we're talking in recent years, average of some 17,000 annual net emigration away from Judea and Samaria. The Palestinian Authority does not consider net emigration. As far as they're concerned, uh, the net migration is zero. As they say during one of the debates, uh, there was between a team which I represent and the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, uh, as long as they do not control international passages, they consider net emigration, net migration to be zero. Well, it's not zero. It's net emigration every single year, and that amounts to some 370,000 net emigration, which they ignore. In Jerusalem, you have 350,000 Arabs. Uh, well, they're all either Israeli citizens or permanent residents of uh, Israel. Therefore, they are counted by Israel as segment of Arabs in Israel. The Palestinian Authority also counts them as Palestinians. And therefore, you have 350,000 Arabs of Jerusalem who are doubly counted uh, by Israel and by the Palestinians as far as the combined population west of the Jordan uh, River. And once again, just like those residents abroad who are away for over a year, uh, they too uh, multiply uh, on a daily basis due to uh, birth. Uh, here you have some documentation of the net migration, which we receive on an annual basis from the Israeli Authority of Population and uh, Emigration. Uh, they document every single international, international passage, land, uh, air and uh, naval uh, passage. And we're talking about another phenomena of uh, 150,000 Arabs who uh, uh, come mostly from Judea Samaria, some from Gaza, who married Israeli Arabs. They are also doubly counted. They are counted by Israel because until uh, 2003, many of them received Israeli citizenship or permanent residence, counted as Israeli Arabs, but the Palestinians keep uh, counting them as well, another double count, and the number grows. The number grows again through uh, birth. The bottom line is when it comes to the population, uh, the combined population, you can see the middle, uh, uh, the middle uh, one uh, is the combined population of the pre-67 Israel, Judea, and Samaria. There is a 68% Jewish majority. 
seven and a half million Jews. And I consider the 400,000 uh, immigrants from the Soviet Union who are Jews according to the law of return, but the rabbinate is yet to consider them Jews. As far as uh, the team which I represent is concerned, demographically, strategically, there's no doubt they're part of the Jewish sector in uh, Israel, seven and a half million, side by side, side by side with two million, two million Arabs in pre-67 Israel and million and a half Arabs in Judea Samaria. Not three million as the Palestinians claim in Judea Samaria, but one and a half. And the one and a half artificial inflation again is uh, achieved by the Palestinians by considering counting the overseas residents who have been away for over a year, by counting, doubly counting the Arabs of Jerusalem, doubly once by Israel, once by the Palestinians, doubly counted Arabs from Judea, Samaria mostly, and Arabs who marry Israeli uh, Arabs, uh, ignoring the 370,000 net emigration and uh, highly inflating the number of birth as documented by the World Bank. Uh, I uh, do not refer to birth to death because death usually is a very small element of any demography. Many more are born than die in our uh, societies. And if you want to talk about the trend, when Theodor Herzl conceived the Zionist idea uh, around 1900, 1897, the first Zionist Congress, there was a 9% Jewish minority in the combined area of Judea, Samaria, and uh, what is today pre-67 Israel. In 1947, 48, when Israel was established, the UN partition plan, uh, the minority grew to 39% uh, in the combined area, Judea, Samaria, pre-67 Israel. And today, uh, 2021, 2022, it's a 68% Jewish uh, majority. I do not uh, contend that that trend from 9% to 39% to 68% will continue, but we are certainly talking about a positive trend rather than a negative uh, trend. And uh, that trend also benefits from a very, very favorable uh, realities when it comes to uh, fertility rate or average number of birth per woman, contrary to misperception, while in the 1960s, there was a six birth gap in favor of Arab women in Israel, nine versus three. In 2015, that gap disappeared completely with an even uh, fertility rate for Jewish and Arab women. And since 2015, every year, the Jewish fertility rate, average number of birth per woman is higher, is higher than the Arab fertility rate. Uh, the latest figure for fertility rate is 20, uh, 20, uh, 2020. And this is where Jewish fertility rate is three birth per woman, while Arab fertility rate within pre-67 Israel is 2.82. When it comes to Judea and Samaria Arabs, it's 2.96, 2.96. Namely, we're talking about higher fertility rate for Jews in Israel than Arabs within pre-67 Israel and in Judea and Samaria. And if that is a big surprise, just wait for the following. Jewish fertility rate in the uh, green line, uh, pre-67 Israel is higher than any Arab country other than Yemen, Iraq, and Egypt. In fact, it's higher than vast majority of Muslim countries other than the sub-Sahara uh, countries. 
and the tailwind uh, also is well documented, uh, well projected through the actual number of annual birth. In 1995, 80,000, 80,000 to be precise, 80,400 Jewish uh, birth. In 2021, 141,000, namely 76% increase in the annual number of Jewish birth, I think this is probably the highest in the world, the highest increase in the world during this uh, years. At the same time, the annual number of Arab birth within pre-67 Israel rose from 36,000 to 43,000, namely 20%, 20% uh, increase uh, as, as far as the annual number of Arab birth, 76% versus 20% increase among, uh, among Arabs. And certainly uh, to that, you have to add the issue of net Arab migration from Judea Samaria, and also the declining number of emigration by uh, Israelis. Uh, Israelis, obviously, just like any other country in the world, do look for opportunities in other countries. But in 1990, in 1990, there was an added number of Israeli emigrants of 14,200. In recent years, the annual addition of Israeli emigrants has been around 7,000 every year. So the annual addition to the overall number of emigrants has been reduced by 50% since 1990. And at the same time, 1990 through 2021, the population uh, in Israel doubled it, uh, itself. Uh, as far as the issue of the increase of Jewish birth, contrary to the conventional wisdom, it's not because of the ultra-Orthodox, it's because of the secular folks in uh, Israel. Obviously, the ultra-Orthodox have the highest fertility rate in Israel, but between 1995 and 2021, 2022, there has been a moderate decline, moderate decline due to growing integration into the job market, not sufficient yet, but substantial increase in the integration into the job market, as well as integration into higher education. And as a result, there has been a moderate drop in ultra-Orthodox fertility rate of some one birth less per woman. At the same time, however, the fertility rate of secular women in Israel has increased in an unprecedented manner, especially among the Yapis in the Tel Aviv uh, area. In fact, uh, Israel is a unique country, probably the only country definitely among Western societies where there is direct correlation between the level of fertility on the one hand, number of births per woman, and the level of education and the level of income. In every other Western society, every other advanced economy, you have negative correlation, namely the higher the level of education, the higher the level of income, the lower the level of fertility, not in Israel. And the reason has to do with uh, three, four distinct uh, elements. Uh, Israel, the Israeli population, left or right, religious or secular uh, hawks or doves, demonstrate the very high level of optimism, patriotism, attachment to roots, certainly frontier mentality, and communal community responsibility. When you are optimistic, a patriot, and you are attached to your roots, 
you produce more children. That's the reason, by the way, that European women do not produce many children due to the pessimism and lack of patriotism and lack of attachment to roots in uh, Europe. Uh, I will end uh, my part here, and I think I don't have a clock here. I exceeded already the 15 minutes, I assume, uh, but I uh, will welcome any uh, questions, not only questions, uh, reservations or opinions on your side, on your end. Wonderful, thank you so much. So we do have quite a few questions coming in. The first one from Jeffrey Norwitz. All of Israel's enemies in the UN support the Palestinian right of return, granting 7.2 million refugees Israeli citizenship, which will immediately make Israel a Muslim majority nation. Doesn't this pose a greater danger than the manipulation of census data? Well, I, I don't think any responsible Israeli even consider uh, negotiation over uh, such uh, 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 unrealistic claim. Uh, it's not only the, the claim that uh, a party which attempted to annihilate another party but was defeated now will claim uh, rights uh, to uh, repossess its previous uh, possession. Uh, the Arabs west of the river collaborated with the military uh, armies of Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon and Syria and Iraq in an attempt to literally annihilate, annihilate, not just defeat the Jewish community in Israel. They lost. They lost, and we won this military battle, which was forced upon us. It's immoral, it's illogical to assume that the uh, aggressor who failed in his uh, or her aggression will claim any right whatsoever. In addition, all those numbers have nothing to do with reality. Uh, there were some 800,000, 750,000 Arabs uh, in uh, the area of pre-67 Israel uh, before the 1948, 1949 uh, war. Before the war started, about 100,000 of them, the wealthy among them, left the country. They ran away because they realized a war is around the corner and they did not want uh, part of it. They left the country. You have to deduct 100,000 uh, right uh, there. We're talking about uh, 50,000, 50,000 who were, uh, who were uh, laborers who came into the area to work due to opportunities, employment opportunities, and they simply went back. Uh, to their uh, countries, and they must be uh, deducted. Uh, we are talking about some 50,000 Bedouins uh, that uh, simply return back to their tribes uh, east of the Jordan uh, River or uh, south of the Negev into the Sinai uh, Peninsula. The bottom line, we are talking back in 1949 at the end of the war, some 300,000 to 350,000 uh, uh, Arabs who, did, who were away from their homes uh, referred to as refugees. Uh, the problem, first of all, the inflated uh, numbers, but then the establishment of the UN uh, uh, Relief and Work Agency, uh, UNRWA, which unlike, unlike the UN High Commissioner of Refugees, which takes care of all refugees throughout the globe, UNRWA perpetuates the position of the refugees as refugees. The UN High Commissioner solves the refugee problem. According to the rules of the UN High Commissioner of Refugees, you don't inherit, you don't pass on to the next generation uh, the claim of or the position of uh, refugees. UNRWA does just uh, that. Uh, in order to solve the refugee problem, in my mind, you have to uh, integrate the Palestinian uh, who claim to be refugees 
into uh, the jurisdiction of the UN High Commission of Refugees. And by the way, uh, back in 1991, after, after the first Gulf War, when the Sheikh uh, of Kuwait, Sheikh Sabah, the ruler of Kuwait was reinstated, the first thing he did was expelling almost all 400,000 Palestinians due to their collaboration with the invasion of Saddam Hussein into Kuwait, which was at that time the most generous host of uh, the Palestinians in the Middle East. Uh, I'm not aware that any UN agency was established to solve their problems. I'm not aware of any uproar on American campuses uh, as a result of the expulsion of the Palestinians from Kuwait, maybe because the Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Sabah of Kuwait is not Jewish, is not so-called Zionist, and therefore why make him a target for criticism? Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so essentially, why would the Palestinians want to increase the numbers artificially? Ken Miller asked, does the huge disparity in population growth preclude any single state solution for Israel to annex Judea and Samaria? Well, uh, th there is an obvious uh, interest, first of all, uh, politically. Uh, you want to impress upon Israelis that uh, uh, it's a losing proposition. Uh, Israel is the Jewish state is going to be defeated through the womb of the Arab uh, woman. Uh, that's a political strategic uh, goal. Uh, secondly, uh, there is an internal uh, political or strategic uh, goal, namely among the different tribes which constitute the Arab population west of the Jordan River, among the different Hamullahs, the larger families, the, the number one loyalty of Arabs anywhere in the Middle East is not the state loyalty, but loyalty to the Hamula, to the uh, tribe, uh, to the ethnic group, to the religious group. Uh, and in order to uh, enhance their uh, posture, their stature, they also increase their numbers artificially. Uh, one of the ways of doing that is uh, minimizing reporting of death. But then there is also the financial uh, reasons. Uh, they want to get more money from the UN, uh, uh, from UNRWA. They want to get more money from the European countries. They want to get more foreign aid uh, from the US. And uh, the, the, the most substantial uh, base of deciding uh, the scope of assistance happens to be the size of the population. Uh, they want to get more water from Israel, and therefore they uh, claim a higher number, uh, and Israel provides them in accordance to uh, their official uh, official number. So uh, again, there are political, financial, uh, strategic reasons for inflating the number, and uh, it behooves it behooves anyone who wishes to be acquainted with reality and not to submit oneself to misperceptions and misleading information is to be educated on the facts on the ground. And as I mentioned before, the figures that you have here are not uh, projections, are not assessments. Every single figure is well documented and mostly, by the way, through Palestinian numbers. However, unlike, unlike Western establishments such as the administration in the US, different governments in uh, Europe, uh, the UN, uh, our study does not accept the Palestinian numbers at face value. What the team which I represent, the three American, six Israelis uh, has done, we have audited, we conducted due diligence, uh, and we now have an audited number. Sadly, the uh, administrations in the West, including the US administration, uh, act as if they accept 
the statements, income statements, uh, balance sheet published by a major, major uh, corporation without auditing. You cannot accept any balance sheet. You don't accept any income statement unless it uh, uh, went under or through uh, due diligence, through thorough auditing. Our study is the auditing of the, of the demographic uh, data published by the Palestinians and Israel. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our webinar. Can you tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, you can see it on my website. Uh, the website is very simple, www. Uh, that, uh, and in one word, the Ettinger Report, Ettinger with double T, www.theettingerreport.com. And when you get to this uh, website, you click on demography and uh, you'll get uh, the, the data uh, through uh, articles, through graphs, and through uh, videos. And, and those of you who would like to communicate uh, directly with me, and I would welcome uh, that, uh, my email address is uh, Yoram Tex, uh, like Tex, like Texas, uh, Y-O-R-A-M-T-E-X, at uh, gmail.com. Hello. So sorry, you froze for a minute there. I did put it in the chat though. So you're on text at gmail.com. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Ettinger. Thank you, we, uh, thank you for really the opportunity. I, I appreciate it. Of course. And for our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update with Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a great day.